Today we're at Singularity University Amsterdam. A theater full of business guys, academics, politicians, excited for the future. I'm sitting here again with uh, John Hegel III, and uh, this is the couple of times that I've uh, met him and I read his book. And he is so sporadic. He basically writes book first, excited about Wikipedia, you know, endless time ago, and, and the network. And then, and then he's writing books about the city as a, as a way to learn quickly and to be passionate about life. And I go, is there, is there any kind of a red line in your work? <laughs> I'd like to think there is. Basically, my focus is on trying to understand the impact of technology on human relationships at all levels, from two people talking to each other to large cities and the interactions that occur within cities that are helped by technology. Okay, well, uh, if you have that kind of a wide fishing net, then of course, okay, the influence on technology on humans and uh, the digital uh, being human and human being digital. But okay, if you then um, let's, let's zoom in, the, the, the power of uh, technology. What is, in the last 10 years, what has happened uh, when the internet became everywhere? What has happened to human relationships in work, but also in private life? Well, it's interesting. My belief is actually well, we have two effects that are somewhat contradictory to each other. One is uh, we're actually creating more pressure on all of us because of this connectivity. It used to be that whatever you knew, you could rely on being successful with that. Now, whatever you know becomes obsolete at a faster rate, so you have to continue to learn, and you cannot relax and just say, I have a problem. Is that really, I mean, I hate to contradict yeah. you, but I do. Absolutely. I think technology change is going extremely slowly. It takes forever. If I talk about something, you know, like uh, autonomous driving cars or electrification, or it takes forever before that basically influences society. It doesn't. It, it doesn't go fast. Mobile payments. Talking about it for 20 years. It's so slow. A smartphone. We. It takes 10 years before it basically reaches society. Why do you think it goes so quickly? Well, it, it goes slowly at the outset. There's the famous quote that we always overestimate the early impact of technology and underestimate the longer term impact. I mean, just take Google as an example, search engines. I can't imagine how we functioned in a world without search engines. And for most people, I mean, certainly there are some who are still not connected, but for most of us, that's become a tool that is central to the way we live our lives. So if we basically see that uh, a lot of technology is already known for a long time, we haven't had the influence on society uh, in, in, in at all. I mean, it's going to change way more. No, I think that's one of the issues. As, as fast as technology does evolve, society and the way we use it evolves much more slowly. And so we're constantly challenged to learn how to take advantage of the technology that's becoming available. Okay, so you uh, think uh, technology speeds up the network and the, the relationships. What do you see as, 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 um, as the next level of change? Will organizations change? Will governments change? Will the way the law works change? Or will they stay as slow as, uh, as they are now? I think everything is going to change at a fundamental level. I mean, if you think about the implications of this technology, we have created institutions of all kinds, companies, schools, governments, that were driven by a set of assumptions about how the world works that are no longer valid. And so I think the successful institutions will be those who step back and say, let's start from ground zero and think about what we can and should do given the new capabilities of this technology. Well, let's take um, a small country as an example, okay? The United States, you know, extremely successful country, but completely incompetent in terms of politics. The financial system is horrible. I mean, how do you view that paradox of biggest economy in the world, biggest military in the world, and on the other hand, the, the, the institutions are incompetent, and what will happen to them in the next five to ten years? Well, I think, it's, again, it's a reflection of uh, the near-term impact of technology, my belief actually is somewhat negative on human relations. We tend, in a world of mounting pressure, we tend to shrink our time horizons to look in a much shorter time horizons, and that erodes trust because basically we're now looking at each other and saying there's only a fixed amount of resources. Who's going to get it? Is it me or you? It's not going to be both of us. One of us is going to win. So that leads to a set of relationships that are very uh, antagonistic, hostile, 
where there's not a lot of trust. And I think we're seeing that play out in our political environment and in a lot of the business environment as well. Trust in all our institutions is becoming less and less over time. But you say it in a way that after a while something magical will happen and we'll get that trust back? <laughs> well, I think the, it's kind of the paradox that when you're in a world of mounting pressure, at some point, someone is going to step back and say, wait a minute, this is just too much. How do we re rethink how we're doing things and what kinds of institutions we need? And those will become the models of success in the new world. And so it's going to take some time for those to play out. But at the end of the day, I think it will be a catalyst to say the old way of doing business, the old way of governing is all needs to be reexamined. Well, John says it very nicely, but I mean, it also see that the pressure can get much higher and at a certain point it will break, which can be civil war, war which can be that 0.1% owns 100% of the wealth. I mean, will it be become really terrible before it gets better? Well, again, I think the, the uh, interesting thing about life is that it is so uncertain and there are very negative scenarios. I think one of the most interesting things that doesn't get a lot of attention is uh, on a global scale, one of the most significant demographic trends is the growth of fundamentalist religion in all types, not just Muslim, but Christianity, uh, Hindu, all of those religions becoming much more fundamentalist and getting more followers at that level. And I think part of it is a response, a natural human response to increasing uncertainty. We want to find some stability, something we can hold on to that we, can, we know is going to be there for us. And fundamentalist religion does provide that. Now, I don't think that's the answer, but it's a natural kind of response to this pressure. And you can an anticipate some very bad scenarios as people become more hostile around uh, religious beliefs and start fighting each other on a global scale. So Normally at Singularity, you only have people who are extremely positive about technology and the influence. And it basically, we get lots of people out of poverty and healthcare. And at least you're also thinking about the possi possibility that it can be worse. Let's go to the second part of our uh, interview. We are redefining in the Netherlands, as everybody is, is, trying to make the goals of education differently. You know, not that you should read, learn to read and calculate and do grammar, but what are the skills we need in education for the 21st century? And I want to know what can we take out of the uh, of the of the of the curriculum, which every kid has to learn in elementary school and high school. How should we organize that? Can we remove a lot of things? Well, I think uh, I would reframe it more. I think this is illustrative of the, the issue that all institutions are going to face. Our traditional institutions were all designed so that we had to find a way to fit in the institution. This was what we needed to do, and you had to uh, take your role and follow the instructions, and you would do well. In schools, that's very much the same thing. You have a curriculum that's predetermined. Your job is to learn the lessons, take the exams, and prove that you've mastered the, the, uh, the content. Mm -hmm. I think increasingly in this new world, schools are going to reorganize around the individual, as opposed to forcing the individual to, to conform to the system, force the system to conform to the individual. And that the real skill, it's not really a skill, but the real uh, characteristic that's going to determine success in this world is passion. And if we don't create school systems that are designed to help every individual discover their passion and then to pursue it, provide them with the tools and the capabilities to pursue that passion, they're not going to be successful in the world, no matter what skills they've learned. Okay, so you basically advocate a lot of freedom for kids to basically determine what they want to learn and, and to discover what they're passionate about and then learn the skills. And then they will learn how to read and do grammar and to do other languages create a rich environment where they can experiment and experience different things, and then as they begin to find something that really excites them, provide them with an environment where they can quickly and easily access the tools and skills required to pursue that interest. That, to me, is going to be the formula for, for success. Okay, well, John Hegel has a belief system in that, but uh, let me ask you, how old are your daughters? My daughters are 30 and 31. So you don't, you haven't been born in an age, or that you haven't raised kids in an age where there's games, and they only want to do Minecraft, and they only want to basically 
totally discovered himself into the uh, into the screens and 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 that every parent is extremely afraid to give the kids the freedom to go in the screen the way they want to how are you going to balance that old fashioned fear which might also be very rational because kids can dive into something you know nonsense and on the other hand your vision you know, again, I think that uh, providing them with an environment that's supportive and encouraging. My daughters actually did live in a world of screens. They were very much on the iPad, um, and one of them became. The iPad is four years old. You heard you, when your kids were s four. Uh, the equivalent of the iPad, the early uh, 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 computer platforms, uh, and my one of my daughters became consumed by the internet and what was available on the internet, and there was. Some people in my family were very worried about that, that she was losing any connection to the rest of the world. That's writing books like crazy about it, and your daughter is disappearing in it. Your wife was completely happy with that? Yeah, well, no, it's a, a little bit concerned. But at the end of the day, she developed a passion for online media, and she now runs a successful media business online, and um, I think has been quite, quite successful. Have some trust in the ability of kids to basically find their own way, and uh, but I mean the choices they then make are also very determined, are very, very important in what what where they're going to end up in life. Absolutely, and uh, I think part of it is creating an environment where they can take some risks and and uh, and have the potential for failure. That you know, if you're really passionate about something, you're not always going to succeed. You're going to fail, and creating an environment where that's okay. So knowing you, you're always working on your next book. How many books have you written, and what is the next title? Uh, I've written seven books, uh, and I'm working on two more books <laughs> uh, at the same time, so I'm obsessed with, uh, with writing. I think uh, I've al always said that I would write even if nobody read the books, just because the process of writing helps me to think through things. So one uh, book is on a combination of I, I try to make a distinction between stories and narratives, and I believe that it's a critical distinction because narratives, the way I define it, are critical to drawing out passion in people, and I think it's something that we haven't fully understood, so. It's different from storytelling? Yeah, so uh, briefly, uh, the distinction I draw is stories typically are self-contained. They have a beginning, a middle, and a resolution, and the story typically is about me, the storyteller, or it's about those people over there, it's not about you. You know, you can use your imagination and think about how you would have acted in that story, but it's not about you. A narrative, the way I define it, number one, is open-ended. There is an opportunity or a threat on the horizon, but it has not yet been achieved or addressed. And the resolution of the narrative hinges on you, hinges on the choices and actions you're going to take and make. People talk about the power of stories, and I think they are extremely powerful. I make the point that throughout history, millions of people have sacrificed their lives for narratives. They've made the ultimate commitment and sacrifice, and I don't think we've fully understood how and why narratives work and how they can draw out passion in a way that's very productive. So the difference is, I think we should go to the moon, and what can you do for your country? <laughs> Yeah, and how can you help get to the moon? You know, this is an opportunity for all of us. We can all contribute. What's going to be your role in, in making this happen? Okay. Are you optimistic about, uh, uh, you, we, we already told you about that. I mean, uh, wha what, is your, wha wha what are you optimistic about and what are you worried about? <laughs> you know, I'm optimistic, again, that the technology that is coming into our lives and society has incredible potential that we're just beginning to understand. And even as we begin to understand the technology today, five years from now, there's going to be exponentially greater performance from that technology. So the opportunity. But good and bad can go, bo can go yeah, both. Uh, good and bad. And, and I think part of the backlash, the risk of backlash, is that we fall back into a, a view that says, no, this is just too much, too uncertain. Let's hold on to what we have and let's fight those who are trying to um, take us into a different different world. Let me ask you one last question about my own personal interest. America always seems to be ahead. You know, we basically think we can isolate ourselves from the bad side of American uh, society, but the inequality, every time I've come to America, I've lived there for a while, and every time I go, this is such an unequal uh, society. 
Ten years later, it's worse. Ten years later, it's, it's again worse. You are now in the point one zero percent because you're on the lecture circuit. You make a huge amount of money per lecture. We, we love you for it. But you're on the top there of the pyramid. How do you see this income division? How do you see that developing over time? I, and I think it is one of the big issues in society. I, I would say that there are a number of different elements to this. People tend to focus on the inequality, which is certainly important. There's another piece, which is even for those who are in the bottom portion of the population, are they better off today than they were 20 years ago? And in America. Most <laughs> societies. In America, but America not. I mean, in most societies. 20 years ago, the average person did not have a smartphone. We have a, we all have a smartphone, but the, the, the average income has they just basically information that they never would have had 20 years ago. So again, it, I think in general, people ha even in the lower tiers of, of income are having a standard of living that is much better than they had 20, 30 years ago. The other piece to the puzzle, which I think again people tend not to focus on, is that top 0.1 percent or whatever, however you want to define it. Uh, there's an, a, a lot of analysis that shows that actually people who are in those ranks fall out of those ranks at an accelerating rate. So once you've achieved that success, it doesn't mean five years from now you're still going to be that successful. More and more people are falling out because of this mounting pressure and the need to continue to stay ahead in whatever you're pursuing. So I think that there's also a lot of pressure at the high end and no guarantee that those people are going to be the ones at, at the top five or ten years from now. Yeah, there might be some circulation, but there's still this big division. So do you see that? Do, do we have a way to solve that? I think over, the, over time we will. I think part of, the, part of this inequality that we're seeing is the difficulty in shifting and adapting to the new environments that we're creating. Some people are doing it faster. Some people are doing it slower and feeling more pressure as a result. And I think over time, I'm, I am not in any way saying that we're going to have a society where everyone is equal. But I certainly believe the current level of inequality is more of a transitional phenomenon than something that's permanent and, and deeply ingrained in the, in the structure of society. Mr. Hagel, always fascinating to talk to you. Thank you.